about um, 10 years ago, I was wandering around the Smithsonian in Washington, uh, admiring various um, things that the British have contributed to the American way of life over the years, like the Star Spangled Banner and the White House, of course. Um, and then I came across this very rather simple, crude, open boat, flat bottomed, uh, but armed with several cannon. And I discovered this was the wreck of the Philadelphia, a gunboat that was sunk by the British during the Battle of Valcour Island in 1776. Now, this wreck was actually rediscovered in 1935. And rather remarkably, it was raised in the same year. Nautical archaeology was a bit simpler in those days. Even more extraordinary was that the hull was exhibited in its waterlogged form as a tourist attraction until 1961, which is when it was finally acquired and preserved by the Smithsonian. If you move around to the, the bow, um, you can see uh, rather more clearly the, the way it's built. Um, very simple, uh, 12 pounder cannon in the mountain in the bow, which actually when it was raised, still had a bar shot hanging out of the muzzle. Uh, more interestingly, it also has still embedded in the bow planking the cannonball that sank it. Now, this was all new to me. I, up to this point, my knowledge of the American Revolutionary War really focused around the East Coast, from New York to Boston and so on. I knew absolutely nothing about the activities in the Champlain Valley. Unfortunately, it turned out that the Smithsonian had published a small book written, in fact, by a former curator, Philip Lundberg, which, besides documenting Philadelphia itself, provided a fair amount of information on the importance of the Champlain Valley. And as I was to, to discover, the geography of this region gave rise to quite a number of specialist vessels not generally found elsewhere and uh, I've tended to specialize in them ever since. This is the, uh, the little book that was, uh, that was produced and it's showing uh, the uh, Philadelphia in the foreground sinking and uh, the crew being taken off by a galley, which we'll come back to many times. Now, I, as I say, I knew absolutely nothing about the importance of this region but in fact, this, uh, what I call the Champlain Valley, I think that's the correct term, runs from the St. Lawrence Seaway up here via Quebec, down the Richelieu River, and uh, through Lake Champlain, and then ultimately the Hudson River and to New York. So the strategic importance of this was that if the British held it, they had access to New York through the back door, if the Americans held it, they had access to Canada via Quebec. And the other thing about it was that leaving aside the indigenous inhabitants who didn't know they needed to be discovered, the European colonists were effectively divided just about 50-50 by this valley. New England one side, middle colonies on the other side. So this was an important strategic element, and there was a, a, a lot of toing and froing, uh, attempting to uh, control uh, this area, and particularly the lake itself. And coming on to October 1770, well, actually, the summer of, of 1776, um, it culminated in a, a standoff between the American forces under Benedict Arnold and the British, the British are coming down from the north. And this is, uh, this map here is this central part of uh, Lake Champlain. This island here is, uh, is Valcour Island. Oh, no, it's not, yeah, yes, it is Valcour Island, take your part. And what happened was that after a certain amount of toing and froing, the Americans withdrew and formed a, a line across this area. This is less, less than a kilometre across at this point. And the British came down from the north and came in. And then the two sets of gunboats just basically slugged it out for a few hours. 
and the British then withdrew. Um, and it was uh, pretty much a score draw. I think you could probably argue that it was an American victory in the sense that the British didn't achieve what they had been aiming to achieve. But one result was that the Philadelphia was one of the gunboats which were sunk. Um, I, I heard recently that apparently, I believe the wreck of the second one, the Spitfire, has now been located. And I think there's some discussion as to whether or not to retrieve it or to preserve it in situ. Just back to this picture again, um, and you'll, you'll find out why I keep harping on about it. This, this book that I got told me, among other things, there was a set of plans for the Philadelphia available from the Smithsonian. Now, something I've learned. If ever you want to buy something from the Smithsonian, just go away and lie down until the feeling wears off. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Originally, the staff told me there was no such thing. These plans didn't exist. Once I established that they did exist, I was told I could only buy them with a dollar check, $200 for a set of the plans actually, dollar check drawn on a New York bank. I thought, wonderful. Well, fortunately, I had a, a colleague in, in Washington and I got him to buy them for me and he did, which he did. And they came accompanied by a very professional receipt handwritten on yellow lined legal paper. <laughs> anyway, I got them and they are in fact very good plans. Hello, what's happened? Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble progressing. Why aren't we moving? That's better, here we are. Um, there are 16 of these plans uh, and the first half dozen or so uh, draw out the, the boat. Every, every frame, in fact, of the boat, such as it is, um, at a scale of 1 to 32. And the remaining plans detail all the equipment, the armaments, etc., etc. I say it's extremely, extremely detailed. But the thing that came out of it was it's just a very simple um, boat, completely flat bottom, 53 feet long, virtually no usable hold space. The deck aft here is laid directly on stone ballast, which I guess was there to balance the weight of the 12 pounder in the balance. Midships, the deck planks are laid directly on the frames and forwards there is uh, a hold space with a headroom of less than 18 inches. And there were 44 men lived on this for three months, and protected purely by a, a canvas awning. By this time I'd come to realize this wasn't going to make a very interesting model, and certainly not one that would justify the space that another large glass case would take up. The penny then dropped and I realized that the painting that we've already seen a couple of times um, of the, uh, the sinking Philadelphia being rescued by the Washington um, would actually make quite a nice um, diorama on small scale. And so I decided that uh, I would go down this route uh, building at a scale of one in 144, um, one each to 12 feet. And as far as possible, I would replicate what's shown in this painting, with one exception. I take the view as a, as a former sailor that nobody in their right mind would adopt, uh, take on a, an operation like this with the wind aft. Um, and as Ian pointed out, in any case, since they're anchored, even if they had tried that, they would immediately swing head to wind. Fortunately for me, this was 10 years ago before um, NRG produced their very nice plans for the Washington. Um, what I had available was, um, oh, I should have said the Washington itself was subsequently um, captured by the British uh, two or three days after the, the battle. 
uh, and the Admiralty took off the lines. So we have the records for the Washington and they were reproduced by um, uh, uh, Howard Chappelle. Uh, and that's, that's what I base my model on. Uh, say since then, NRG have produced much more detailed plans. These are both going to be waterline models and therefore they were flat bottomed. And so I could build them on plugs. And I started off with, with Philadelphia and this is the, the lower solid part of Philadelphia attached to the plug. Um, I then, having shaped it to produce the outside shape, I then fitted what interior detail there was, put it back on the plug, and then planked that whole area below the, the level of the, the plug itself. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, I didn't record the next stages for quite a while until I got to this point, where you can see the hull is complete, it's got the, um, the framework for the awning up, most of the figures in place, uh, the guns and so on, and I've started putting the fascines on. So why I didn't photograph things in between, I don't know. One thing I, I've been asked a couple of times um, was how I made the various figures. Well, it's a, it's a pretty standard technique, in fact, and this is how, how it was done. It's just basically a hairpin of copper wire uh, with a piece folded across, and this can then have can be flattened at the ends to give you hands and feet. And it's built up by applying um, artists modeling paste, which is a sort of gesso, uh, uh, very fine plaster, uh, with the tip of a, a cocktail stick or a wooden skewer. And uh, you can make them as simple or as crude as, as you like, or you can build them up. But if I were to do it properly, uh, there would be 40 odd men on Philadelphia and 80 odd on the Washington and I wasn't up for building 120 figures. So I've made a representative number to make it look crowded, but nowhere near 120. Okay, so having got uh, Philadelphia underway, I could turn my attention to the Washington, uh, which was also built on a plug. Now, Washington has a pronounced tumble home. So in this case, the plug has to be demountable so that it can be removed once the planking is done. So the removable part is in three pieces held together with, or at least, yes, held in alignment rather than together with steel dowels. And the lower part, which will ultimately become part of the model itself, uh, is the region from below the waterline up to just below the eventual deck level. And here's the upper part of the plug, the three parts and slotted bow and stern to take the uh, stern posts, the stem and stern posts, which are glued into this lower section. And this is just other views of the same thing. Uh, and of course, the only thing you've got to watch is that these steel pins are above the shear line because you know, otherwise you're not going to get them out afterwards. So having done that and planked the hull, I've then left the planking on the plug and uh, screwed it to a block of MDF and then clamped the whole thing in a carpenter's vise and used that to cut the um, gum ports and the ore ports while it was still supported by the, um, by the plug. Yeah. I should have said the, the planking is only half millimetre, 20 thou thick, so the, the hull itself is very fragile at this stage. It needs pretty good support. But that process works quite well, and there is the, the end result at that stage. Um, Moving on a little bit, uh, I laid uh, a, a deck of uh, about a millimetre thick, which then allowed me to 
project provide the correct camber. And um, with all due respect to Ian, I wasn't going to try planking a deck like this. <clears throat> I've computer printed it. But the reason that it, it looks, though I say it myself, really quite effective, is that I then varied the tone of every plank. The real problem with um, what Ian quite rightly says is that paper decks look like paper, is that they're usually printed in a single colour. And if you vary the tone, it can look quite, uh, uh, quite convincing. And I, I think this, this does. Um, this is again a, a somewhat later stage. You can see we've got the capping rails on, um, various guns have been added, um, and uh, I've put in the, the hatches, pumps, and gratings. Again, I'm afraid the gratings are computer printed. I know my limitations. Just a, a word or two about the guns. Wash it, this fleet of Benedict Arnolds was thrown together at very short notice and with anything they could lay their hands on. Washington had two 18-pounders, two 12-pounders, two 9-pounders, two four, four, I think two four-pounders, or maybe six, can't remember, and swivel guns. Keeping track of the ammunition must have been an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Because just eyeballing it, it would be very hard to tell the difference of whether you've got the right ball. Uh, also, not very easy to make at this scale. This is 144 scale. And you see overall there are typically around the 14 millimeters, 13, 14 millimeters long. But working one's way along the barrel, it, I'm afraid it, it was beyond my mental arithmetic. So I, what I actually did was modify my Unimat lathe with a digital readout so that I didn't have to keep track in my head of the various, uh, the various distances along each barrel. And uh, so I put the digital readout on. I also enlarged the wheels there. So this is one, one division there is 0.05 of a millimeter. Uh, which is um, 2,000. And there's a, a finished 18-pounder sitting on a, a British 5P piece, which is, as near as damn it, identical to a dime. It's actually 2,000 larger in diameter. So next stage was to get the rigging done, so I simply screwed this hull uh, to the, the well, I think the same bit of MDF, mounted it on a tripod head, which allowed me to swivel it around to various angles to get get at the rigging. Um, making the uh, shrouds and rat lines uh, was pretty standard practice, uh, using a slotted uh, board like this. You stretch the shrouds over pins of uh, the appropriate spacing and then simply wrap it with, in this case, fly tying silk and glue it in place and then slice the, uh, the, the unnecessary silk away. A chap named Bob Wilson from the um, Northwest Shipwrights has got a very nice variation on this. He, instead of cutting these slots in the jig, which of course are fine for this particular scale, but no good for any other scale. He uses a frame and puts in different um, gauges of screw threaded rod. And the screw pitches that, that are commonly available conveniently mirror the sort of spacings one is often looking for in rat lines. So that's, that's quite a, a useful tip there. And of course, it's, it's very easy to change to a different size. Now, once we got to this stage, I had to start making it look as though the uh, 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 <coughs> Washington had been in a battle. And in fact, apparently, she was in a practically in a sinking condition. The captain was having a great deal of trouble um, keeping her afloat. 
Um, I've no idea whether or not the foremast was actually shot away. Um, Hass's painting shows it, and therefore I've copied that. But uh, uh, that shows it, it's coming along, but it still needs a lot more, um, a lot more chaos to, to convey the, the right impression. So here we are, the next stage was to, uh, to put the yard and sails on. Sails are tissue paper soaked in tea uh, to give them the right colour. And just mention the flags, I, this is a technique I use quite often and that's uh, use an inkjet printer on cigarette paper. And that produces a very nice result. And the beauty of it is that once you've printed it, you can't tell which side of the cigarette paper actually got printed because it, it goes, just shows through. So you only got to do it once. Right, and there's the, the final result. Um, I found that this board was looking a bit bare over in the corner, so I allowed my imagination to play there with a little rescue in the background. But there, that's the final, um, the final effect, which I think is reasonably convincing. And if we look back again at the, the painting and compare it with the uh, a photo, a setup photograph, I, uh, I'm quite pleased with the the correlation between those two. And. That essentially is it. There's a couple, couple more shots here of uh, showing these are some of the more detailed figures that I put on the uh, on the quarter deck. Um, the, the, most of the crew figures you probably notice are pretty crude. These I put rather more effort into getting the detail right. And here's the uh, the bow looking a bit more chaotic. But also, once you get to this amount of uh, magnification, it's showing up the fact that it's got extremely dusty. I need to give it a good clean, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. However, uh, that's it.